Okay. All right, we are live, I think. How's it going, folks? I love the first comments. Recovering anarchist, question mark. Greetings from Sweden. Just got going to sleep. We'll listen later. Wondering the anarchist thing. Why now? That's a great question. That's a great question. And we are going to get into some gravy tonight for sure. Um, yeah, that's the question. Why did I, why did I call tonight's stream... Uh, Confessions of a Recovering Anarchist. Well, uh, one reason is I needed something to talk about, and it's something that I think about a lot. So I thought there would be some gravy into this that we can we can uh, serve up on um, One Faith Families Potatoes and uh, Mashed Potatoes and Pot Roast, <laughs> as, as mentioned in the stream. We can put some gravy on those potatoes, and um, yeah, we can sink our teeth into some ideas and 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 perhaps even better some practical ideas and that's kind of why i wanted to riff on this tonight about um anarchism and uh so yeah we're gonna get into that welcome folks welcome to the stream come on in say hello smash the like we'll get this puppy warmed up and uh okay my connection is looking better now it said at first it was struggling uh, but now it is looking good. Can you guys hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up. Let me know. And tonight's stream uh, probably won't be too long because we're going to do Twitter spaces after. So right after, well, at 8 o'clock we'll start. So at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right now. Might be 8, 10, 9, some other time zone for you. And so the spaces are late. But I'm going to have Derek Bros coming into the space. And the whole theme of tonight's stream and uh, the space after. I'm calling the uh, the space the um, Anarchist Hotline. <laughs> and uh, I want to just talk about sort of my uh, philosophy on anarchism and why I've kind of fallen out of love with it in a way as, as, a, as a philosophy uh, in some ways, but in other ways I've been reinvigorated and re-inspired by it in, in, in others. And, and I'll kind of get into that. So first, some definitions. Let me share my screen here. And uh, I got some good definitions here. So, well, for, first of all, um, what is this whole thing about with anarchism? Well, a bit, a bit of background, I guess, um, before I jump into definitions and stuff. So I, I've been intrigued um, by anarchist and sort of free market philosophy, uh, anarcho-capitalist ideas like this. I, I, start, I read Ayn Rand when I was 18, Atlas Shrugged. And at the time I wasn't into free market capitalism at all. I was probably more of a leftist. However, the, th that book Atlas Shrugged really stuck with me for many years and it didn't really kind of come back its importance in my life and my thinking till way later in my life. But it did plant a seed um, in my mind at about 18 years old. And um you know, if you're not familiar with the the uh, general story of Atlas Shrugged, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a, a classic literature book that it's worth reading. It's really dense. Um, Ayn Rand is a was a genius, I think, uh, just a such a high level thinker and, and such an interesting personality. Um, but anyways, the story is that um, society gets to a point where there's there's no motive. Socialism makes it into a world where there's no real motivation to do anything and to succeed because the state takes all your shit basically. And so there's a bunch of people and I'm, I'm making a crazy short uh, synopsis of Atlas Shrugged. So bear with me and, and, and just look into it yourself. But basically the idea is that there will be a sector of society that will leave the masses who are dependent to create a society based on uh non-coercion and, and and voluntary um relationships which means that all the productive people leave society and why ayn rand's book i think is so profound uh, especially today is that 
we're seeing the tail end of state capitalism, call it socialism, the U S social, the U S is a socialist country. Canada is a socialist country. Most Western nations are socialist countries. If you have, if you're living in a country that has an income tax and social programs, um, and of course, varying degrees of that and the devil's in the details, as I say, uh, you live in a socialist country or what's referred to as a state capitalist society. In my opinion, they're both essentially the same thing is the idea is that you have to take resources group and have an agency or a bureaucracy to delegate who gets the the resources, which creates all kinds of mal incentives in society. And Ayn Rand uh, wasn't the only thinker uh, discussing um, anarchism and free marketism. There's many Hayek and Rothbard and Friedman and uh, and more, more, I'm crossing into libertarianism and, and free market thinking, also anarcho capitalism. It's very broad. It's very broad. But um, I was kind of exposed to those ideas fairly young. Um, and they came back to me later, but they, they keep coming up because the world is at, at a sort of a perilous juncture where we're seeing the power of the state um, get to levels that we don't like, you know, depending on where you lived during the whole COVID racket, um, you saw varying different degrees of soft tyranny in some places, maybe quite strong tyranny, depending on where you were. I would say where I was, it was soft in uh, Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, where I was for most of COVID. And then I moved here, uh, I guess for the second half of it, really. Um, but it was soft tyranny and it wasn't really tyranny at all. It was just tyranny imposed through, uh, corporate lackeys, you know, so just tyranny imposed by grocery stores because the government didn't want the liability to do it. And as we've seen, uh, even with some recent developments in Canadian law, um, particularly the, uh, Supreme court ruling that said that the, um, government of Canada or the, the Trudeau administration, whatever you want to call their racket, um, was in fault. And they, 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 it was, it was unjustified for them to use the emergencies act. And so all the COVID fines, you know, there's so, there's going to be so much, um, retributive justice, I guess, with this whole thing, people are going to go back now, now that there's precedent in the court, people are going to go back and get some level of justice, at least get reimbursed for the, the, the BS that they had to, uh, fines they had to pay or whatever they did. But anyways, we all saw a level of tyranny. And I think for many people, it was, well, I not I think, it was a red pill moment for many, many people. I'm sure a lot of people that started listening to my streams during those years um, came in because I was speaking um, truth and, and it was... Uh, and it was uh, resonating with a lot of people. And so a lot of people are still here today because of of the kind of things that I started talking about during that time, because I, w I, I called it out because I wasn't going to just sit by and uh, not say anything about this. And, and you could you could make the case that that I uh, damaged my career in some way to do that. But in other ways, I didn't. I did in the sense that I could have just been the garden guy and kept talking about garden stuff and have a channel with millions of subscribers and not be shadow banned and all that. But I don't think I would live, uh, I don't think I would be able to live with myself. And that's just me. That's just my contacts. If you didn't, I'm not saying that you you should have or anything like that, whatever. You do your thing. But that's the, that's the path I chose. And I took a stand on an issue and it got me to where I am in some degree. And I'm actually quite thankful for it. I'm thankful for the New World Order's tyranny because it actually motivated me to move beyond just the ideas of anarchism. And we're going to get into all that. Um, but also to actually do it in practice. And I guess since that time, I have really been faced with thinking about anarchism and free marketism and, uh, you know, just real free market capitalism, anarcho-capitalism, the ideas of liberty, prosperity, all these kinds of things, um, a lot more poignantly because I took a big step towards freedom and I kind of put my money where my mouth was. Like I did it. I went out, I, I went into the country. I exited and builded as, as, as John Bush, buddy of mine, uh, has a summit down in Texas, which I was supposed to go to. And, and, uh, I couldn't make it because of government BS, uh, last year. But, um, 
I exited it and built it. I exited and built, I guess you could say. And so I've had an experience with the idea of freedom in a lot of a, a different way than I had prior because I didn't, I took some steps in my life to, to live more free. Even getting into farming was that to some degree for me because I, uh, it allowed me to control my food, make a living on my own land. Like there was certain, there was enabling features that came out of me doing those things, but certainly by and large, moving out to the land where I am now was the biggest decision that my wife and I made to uh, take major steps towards freedom. And uh, in this stream, we're going to get into a lot of these types of things. I want to try to focus on um, solutions and try to stay positive about thinking about these things. But I will tell you that um, one sort of way I've, I've described myself, at least is aligning my philosophical views with my practical views is like the way I'd like the world to be versus how it is, or the way I'd like people to be um, and the way they are. And so what that really comes down to is that in principle, I would consider myself an agor an anarchist or an agorist or a, or a, um, anarcho-capitalist or something like that is it in that I believe in freedom for the individual. I believe that every individual should have the choice to decide how they want to live their life, whatever that may be, as long as it's not causing harm to somebody else or damaging somebody's property, that that's how we should choose to live. And if I could wave my magic wand, that's how I would, I would say that everybody should live. Unfortunately, we have the elephant in the room, which is the average Walmart shopper. <laughs> okay, so I've used that term in the past, uh, put it out on Twitter, uh, had this conversation about anarchism going on Twitter. If you follow me on X or Twitter, uh, a lot of really cool people made comments. Uh, and some of the stuff, those ideas I'm going to share or inspired me with this conversation tonight. Um, but uh, we have the average Wal Walmart shopper. And so this is the crux, in my opinion, of where ideas in anarchism become completely pointless. Um, however, I'm going to talk about multiple things, ideas that came out of free market philosophy and some degree anarchism that have been huge inspirations for me. But for the most part, my general thesis of tonight's conversation is going to be that the summation of that is going to be that you can talk about anarchism all you want. Like you can say the state shouldn't do this and the state shouldn't do that. At the end of the day, um, you're just talking about how the world ought to be if you could wave your magic wand, which is fun. And, and it's great to sit around and smoke a joint and just like have a philosophical conversation with people. That's something that I like to do. But at the end of the day, it's not moving the needle for myself or my family. And um, so, you know, for a guy, uh, myself in my 40s and uh, have children and obligations and shit to do and freedom to accomplish, um, philosoph uh, philosophizing about how the world ought to be is at some point pointless. Uh, when you're in college and when you're younger, uh, these conversations are great to have and they're very character forming and I think they're all really good and great. Um, but there gets to a point, especially I think now with where we are in society, is that shit's getting real. Shit's getting crazy. And it has, it's been getting more and more crazy. Uh, COVID was one part of it. Now we're into mass migration invasion of North America, Canada too. And the WEF, and uh, the tyranny that's continuing, you have to ask yourself, when do I stop wasting time in conversation? And we're having conversation here, right? So we can waste some time in conversation. But at the end of the day, where do we start to implement uh, the shit in our life, right? Uh, sorry about that. Thanks, Pope on my computer. Um, and so that's where where I'm going with all this is that if you can't form a collective society, so, well, okay, let, 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 let's, let's look at some definitions right now. Actually, before we get any further, 
Uh, I don't have a script. I have a, uh, some loose notes that I wrote down and um, kind of a framework in which I'm going to present my case tonight. Uh, and then we'll run into the uh, the Twitter spaces. Hey, actually, before I just jump into this, um, we have an offer for freedomfarmers.com, folks. It's 50% off it, your first year, your first annual off, the, your first uh, year for Freedom Farmers. So it's normally 600 bucks a year. Now it's 300. There's a link in the description of this video. If you wanted that offer, it's insane value because the Homestead Accelerator, all the courses, our community, our directory for properties and all that stuff, um, 300 bucks basically gets you all that stuff for a year. So, and you can cancel any time. So check that out uh, if you want. That's in the uh, the show notes below. And smash the like. Let's get some more folks in this stream. And then we're going to get into some gravy here. Um, so here's some definitions. So I like, I like to look at broad definitions. Or I like to look at multiple definitions, not just one. Because if you ask the average anarchist what anarchy means, it's it's the same as asking the average permaculturalist what permaculture means. You're going to get a mixed bag. So uh, one that I like, this is right out of Black's Law, fifth, uh, anarchy, absence of government, state of society where there is no law or supreme power, lawlessness or political disorder, destructive uh, of and confusion in government. At its best, it pertains to a society made orderly by good manners rather than law, in which each person produces according to his powers and receives according to his needs. And at its worst, the, wor the word pertains to a terroristic resistance of, uh, of all present government and social order. For criminal anarchy, see criminal. So what, a comment on this definition is... Um, the better side of it here, where it says, at best, it pertains to a society made orderly by good manners rather than law, in which each person produces according to his powers and achieves according, uh, receives according to his needs. So this is, that's anarchy at its best. But again, this is where the problem of the average Walmart shopper arrives, okay, <laughs> is that the average Walmart shopper, which is a metaphor um, for the average voter or the average citizen in a nation state or a large geographical area doesn't give a shit about freedom. They just want the most convenient lifestyle and just want the things that they need to, sati to satiate their desires in the here and now. That's pretty much it. And so again, we'll circle back to the crux of this throughout this presentation is just that um, you, if, if your society is rooted in, in, and it's orderly, you need to have a high degree of the individual. You have to have an individual who's educated, has enough resources so that they're very comfortable in their life, has, you know, has to have some amount of wealth, also have to have um, some amount of uh, 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 empathy and ability to socialize and, and work with a group of people in an orderly way. But the average individual is a dipshit. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this in lies the problem with proposing anarchy as a solution for anybody outside of a community that you can't form yourself. And we'll get into that too, because that's where anarchy does exist and that's where it should exist. Uh, and it does ex anarchy in a way exists everywhere, like the air we breathe. But then at the same time, and my, a guy like Michael Malice, if you ever listen to him, he really makes that um that argument and, and it's a decent argument in that any relationship that's just based on voluntary interaction is in itself anarchy but if that then that becomes where everything's anarchy and then in a way it becomes meaningless it's just like if social justice warriors call everybody a nazi nobody's a nazi because it doesn't really mean anything and so that that argument that malice makes is it, 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 in a way the same as that in my opinion is this you kind of degrade the term of, of anarchy. So let's just, again, circle back to definitions and then see if we can find some, you know, some kind of cohesiveness in all this. In uh, This is also in Black's Law, fifth edition. Uh, the definition of anarchist is one who professes and advocates the doctrines of anarchy. Uh, in the immigration statutes, uh, it includes not only persons who advocate the 
overthrow of organized government by force, but also those who believe in the absence of government as a political ideal and seek the same uh, end through propaganda. And, you know, take these for what they're worth. I'm not standing by any of these, but these are just what they are. So those two were Black Law's fifth. This is Google, anarchy, a state of disorder due to absence of non uh recognition of authority and other controlling systems to the organization of uh, society on the basis of voluntary cooperation without political institutions or hierarchical government anarchism. So these ones here now are getting more into what closer to what an anarchist, I think your average anarchist would talk about. Um, whereas Black's laws, you know, the second part of each of these, actually, you could probably find some commonality in, this is from Webster's Dictionary. Um, anarchy, A, the absence of government, B, the state of lawlessness or political due or political disorder due to the absence of government authority. These are both similar to Black's Law. Um, and uh, yeah, so those are some definitions. I think what you would um, find is what a lot of people who profess um, ideas of anarchism today will talk about voluntarism and that's it's it's just it's the same thing really but it's less of a brace of word in my opinion and it's the idea that that society should be based around voluntary interactions with with one another so that we can we, we can organize ourselves voluntarily and again that's all well and good if you don't have the average walmart shopper and so as long as you're sharing a geographical area with the average Walmart shopper, the average citizen, the average voter, the average idiot who puts on three masks, the average idiot who goes along with everything that the government tells them to do, how the hell are you going to convince them that anarchy is a good plan? You you never will. So this is the, the this is the the biggest crux um with anarchy is that you end up in this place where you can't really do anything with it. It's just a political ideology that actually is more unlikely to be achieved than likely to be achieved because especially when you look at the current environment of the average Walmart shopper is that most people are useless. They have no practical skills. They get everything from the grocery store every couple of days. They're, they, they have no agency over the resources in their life. They go to a job and get a check. And if the shit were to hit the fan tomorrow, they would essentially be dead in three to seven days. That's the average Walmart shopper. And and uh, I, I will say Walmarts are a lot different in the U.S. than than Canada. And even in the U.S., there's quite a bit difference between a Walmart in, say, Vancouver, Washington, than there would be um, the south side of Chicago. And I've been to a Walmart in the south side of Chicago. And let me tell you, that is that's probably more of the model on the extreme side of of what the average Walmart shopper looks like. But you, you probably get what I mean culturally when I say that is that if you're trying to form a society with the average Walmart shopper, it's never going to happen. They are always going to vote for more government and more free stuff. And that's, we get into this endless spiral, which is almost the metaphor of the snake biting its tail, right? Where it's a self-fulfilling prophecy is that because we've had so many years of propaganda to make you dependent on the state and all these institutions and uh, sectors of the economy that have also made to do that as well as uh, government programs, of course, um, that uh, we have bred that the environment that we have. And so how the hell do you think you're going to implement any sort of form um of anarchy. So it's, it's crazy now. However, I do want to give some do. I want to, uh, give some props to some anarchist thinkers, um, and ideas that might not necessarily be anarchist, at least in their author's intent, but they were very much so for, for my life. So let's, Let's now flip around to, um, let's kind of come to a consensus, perhaps, if we can. And maybe you guys can, in, in the in the chat, just smash the like or 
say something and say hell yes in the chat is that we could probably all agree that if you come from some sort of philosophical desire to see anarchy in some way and basically whether that's just straight liberty like libertarianism maybe a minimalist state um no state or whatever but generally we could all probably agree that we want freedom that that, that that's really what we're talking about is like we want freedom you guys agree with me like do, who wants freedom who wants to be able to choose and and live w without being under the gun or under the thumb of a coercive state who wants that right i want that hell yes smash the like tell me if that if you agree um and so so that's you know the basic idea there now uh, let me talk about some things that have been i think are really cool contributions to uh, the ideas of anarchy um there was somebody share i'm going to share this slide this is i grabbed this from the um the twitter thread that i had going on um this yesterday and somebody shared this image of ancap studies so that's the the ancap flag is the is the yellow and black flag there and there's different types of anarchists there's an as anarcho capitalist there's anarcho syndicalists there's there's all kinds of stuff and i and anarcho syndicalism is this idea that came out of noam chomsky and it's essentially communism because it's let's use the state to achieve communism and then we'll have anarchy. And it's like, that'll never happen because nobody will ever get their power and then not give it up and then give it up. It's so it's ridiculous in my opinion. Uh, however, an anarcho-capitalism seems to be where a lot of the ideas that, that I've kind of agree with have settled into that philosophy. And this, and this is a little cool, uh, not the greatest re resolution, but actually not too bad. I can, I can zoom in on here. Uh, and some of these books I read, most of them I haven't, but, but I see some Ayn Rand in here. I see Mises. I see um, Das Kapital from Karl Marx. It's actually an important book to read, I think, if if you want to, um, you know, refute socialism and understand it. Um, and that's why they've got it under uh, ref refutations, which is super cool. Um, Tragedy and Hope, of course, Carol Quigley, incredible. Uh, more Mises stuff in here. Peter Schiff's got some good contributions to the ideas of, of anarchism, as, at least in the economy is concerned. Um, uh, the Fatal Conceit, Hayek, that's a classic. That, you can get that on audiobook, actually. I've got that on audiobook. Um, what else? Some good stuff. Anyways, some good, some good stuff, some good, some good ideas in here and, um, lot, lots of gravy in there too. Like it's, it's good stuff, especially if you're, if you want to understand something so that you can refute it, I think it's important. I think it's important to, to know what you're talking about. And so it's good. It, read books, man. Check them out. Read books. It's uh it's a good thing. So anyways, some other contributions to the idea of anarchy. Uh, some of them I don't think I saw any in there, but I wanted to mention some uh, that I think have been incredible. So I mentioned Ayn Rand at the beginning. Um, Atlas Shrugged is a is a is a is a is a, is a worldview changing book in my opinion. Um, and uh, the Fountainhead is almost as good, but I think if you had to read one Ayn Rand book, that's the one I'd recommend as Atlas Shrugged. But you can go back on YouTube, and it's it's kind of cool to go into YouTube and listen to old Ayn Rand uh, debates and conversations she had. Man, she was a smart cookie, and um, listening to her in debate is is amazing. I would also suggest, as far as economics are concerned, listening to old Thomas Sowell and um, and uh, Milton Friedman uh interviews and conversations and you know a lot of the stuff that came out of uh Stanford University which was uh what was the the Hoover Institution uh Peter uh what's his name Peter something he has those uh liberty talks where he interviews all these old you know economists and stuff like that Thomas Sowell is on dozens of times um those are great conversations too but uh, another another uh, author thinker that really actually changed my mind a lot on anarchism was Stefan Molyneux. So if you're not familiar with with Steph, you should be familiar with Steph. Um, he's he's become he got really banned. You know, he got he, and and he got just he was doing huge on YouTube for a long time, 
and um he just got shut down basically off YouTube, but he went on to the alternative platforms and he's still posting today. Um, but I stopped kind of listening to Stefan Molyneux when he just went on the Trump train and just started talking about politics of the day. Um, I felt like it was a move just to get clicks and, and, and maybe he had to do that to make, to keep making a career as a content creator. And so I can, I totally empathize with him and I still think he's great, but two books of his that are really, really interesting are one is called Practical Anarchy. And it's a book that just talks about the future. And he actually has a new book, apparently, about it's like a sci-fi about a future sort of anarchist utopia. And I, I'm, I'm keen to read it, actually. Maybe I'll read it this winter, um, but I haven't read it. But but in this book, Practical Anarchy, which is quite old, I think it's at least 10 years old, uh, he, he lays out a lot of ideas on how society could be structured and even addresses security. How do you, how do you protect people from physical violence? Um, uh, Practical Anarchy is a really good book. Uh, and, and and the other book of his that, and even just, it's it's not even just the book, but it's his entire thesis of this idea of peaceful parenting, which has been really profound for myself. And I would say even my wife inadvertently, though she wouldn't know what I'm talking about, but um, she's probably listening to the stream right now as she's maybe getting the kids ready for bed and stuff, um, is that we have both really implemented this idea of peaceful parenting into our parenting style, which is to just not hit our kids ever. And Stefan Molyneux makes an amazing case and he presents psychological information that basically hitting children develops a distrust with the parent that scars you for life. And, and it did for me. Uh, my dad hit me when I was a kid. Not a lot. I, I wasn't abused or anything, but there were some times where I really got out of line as a boy, as boys do. And my dad didn't know how to deal with me. So he hit me. And um, again, he's like, not like he beat me and all that, but we got spanked with a belt if we, you know, didn't listen. And, uh, but, and, it, and, and, and to my dad's credit, it would take us a long, like it took a lot to get there, right? Like it's not like my dad just wanted to hit us. It wasn't that at all. Um, but he did. And it actually scarred my relationship with my father until I was probably in my late twenties, to be honest, to really, really think about it. Um, and so that sucks. <laughs> and so you don't want to do that. So we don't hit our kids. Uh, if we have to take disciplinary measure, um, it's, uh, it's things that are nonviolent, but it is sometimes removal. Like you're going out of here and you're going to go in the corner or something like that, but it's, we don't hit. And so Stefan Molyneux's books, Practical Anarchy, Anarchy and Peaceful Parenting are absolutely critical anarchist reads. If you want to be an anarchist who actually does shit, right? So I, I got to, I, I I'll shout out more people between this and the space, but another guy like that is Jack Spierko. He's a really cool, you know, if you don't know the Survival Podcast, Jack Spierko, uh, I've done podcasts with him many times, was part of the original um, Unloose the Goose podcast when it started. And a lot of those guys that associate with Jack, guys and girls, are are, are all really great thinkers. And and they, this is where the ideas of anarchy started to intersect with permaculture. And, and, and for myself, that intersection was actually where the philosophical ideas came more into the practical ideas. Okay, we have these ideas of anarchism and voluntarism. So what do we do with these things, right? So uh, I think, again, Stefan Molyneux's books there are actually applicable. They're totally applicable, especially peaceful parenting. You could almost, I, I, you could almost make the case that the idea of peaceful parenting has the most potential compounding effect of any principle in anarchy ever created. Because if people just simply stop hitting their children, we don't go into a society expecting coercion. And that's fundamentally what the state is. The, the, the nation state is a corporation, bona fide commercial corporation that has the monopoly on the use of force. And so the state can kick the shit out of you without repercussion. They are, um, what do you call, deputized. But if you do that to somebody else, there's repercussions and punishments for that. So the state has the state has a monopoly on the use of force, and understanding that from a principled standpoint is also important too. I, I think it 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 makes a framework of what you have to understand if you want to think about 
anarchism on a practical level, is you have to fundamentally understand that the state is a coercive agency. Uh, however, and this is where I'm going to get into later about my falling out of love with anarchy because I've had so much success with the state and getting things uh, and finding freedom using the state and understanding the state. So we'll get to that. But more on some of these an anarchist ideas that are super important. So the other one is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, as far as the economy is concerned, the uh, the great, in my opinion, and I know a lot of some anarchists will debate this, and 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 people will just free free minded people will debate this for sure. It's a contentious statement, but let me make my case. Bitcoin is perhaps the most transcendent utility item thing that comes out of anarchy, and so I'm not totally sure. Satoshi Nakamoto, who was the mysterious creator of Bitcoin, was an anarchist, though if you read the white paper, there's a lot of anarchist ideas in there. And I'm not super versed in it to just pull those quotes out and whatnot, but I think people in Bitcoin would generally understand and agree with me that you know Bitcoin is the most effective and widely used free market tool for the economy that we've ever seen even more than precious metals and the reason is is that the blockchain is decentralized so the blockchain if you if you maybe i'll have to some people just don't know bitcoin and maybe it's worth me just explaining it a little bit but the way bitcoin works is it's a it's a it's a form of money that's created out of computer hash basically running CPUs to solve mathematical problems that create mining. So there's work, just like I have to go to mine gold, you do the work to get the reward, and then the reward goes on the economy. Bitcoin does that. It does it through CPUs decentralized, and those CPUs have a dual effect. Uh, maybe they have more actually. I'm not the biggest Bitcoin advocate. I'm in I'm in Bitcoin. I've been into it for a number of years and it's I think it's great. It's a tool in the toolkit. I'm not saying you have to use Bitcoin. I'm saying it's the be end all of everything. It's a tool in the toolkit. And I'm hoping that I'm going to outline more of those these tools in the toolkit as we go through this talk. But Bitcoins um so the computers mine the Bitcoin to produce the thing that's needed for the economy. It's verified. The blockchain makes it so you can't replicate or forge Bitcoins. Um, and then the CPUs on the other end, the, the, the mass amount of CPU power that's decentralized also creates the foundation for the blockchain to exist and to process transactions. So all that CPU power isn't just running power to, to, to mine. It's, it's running power to support the network as it grows. And the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that it's the opposite of centralization. So with the state, with the coercive agency of the state, it's a monopoly on force, but it's also a monopoly on a bunch of other stuff. It's, it's, it's the main other thing it's a monopoly on is a, it's a monopoly on money because once the state got into central banking and created private central banks with a special club of people who shall not be named, who get to run the show, you create a complete uh, plutocracy, which is the system we have is a plutocracy in many ways. Um, and so Bitcoin is a solution. Yeah, rich people can buy up a lot of Bitcoin, no doubt. But I've seen people who came from nothing who are Bitcoin millionaires because they got into it and they figured it out and they found ways to make money at it. And so the, the the most the most enabling thing about Bitcoin, as far as an anarchist idea, is what what's the state's greatest power? It's the, the monopoly on force. It's the ability to go to war. So in in the case of the United States hegemony, it's the ability to to print money and spend it on guns and bombs and bomb the shit out of the world. Right? That's, that, that is absolutely the most harmful aspect of the state as we know it in the case that we're talking about in the current empire that we live in is the Anglo-American Anglo establishment, uh, which is a combination of you know the Vatican, the city of London, and Washington, D.C. as the military arm to basically execute uh, the enslavement of the world in, in, in many different ways, and, and, and the American people being the, the biggest slaves of them all. But that's Bitcoin is a solution to that because you can't just print Bitcoin. So 
to see countries like El Salvador and 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 other countries starting to adopt Bitcoin is a huge step to to actually realizing what a free society might look like. Is it going to be the all the, the 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 perfect anarchist society? No, of course not. I don't think that exists. I don't think that'll ever exist. I think it can anything can exist the smaller it gets. The bigger it gets, the harder it is. So I would even say on a philosophical st standpoint, I'm a communist in my family. My family between my my wife and my two children, my wife and I are communist dictators who run all the decisions for our family and all the resources are controlled by us. And it will be that way if our children become of age where they can start managing things themselves. And so then the whole dynamic of it changes. But you can think about, you know, or 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 I, I'm a communist dictator with my chickens, right? My my my, my chickens and their movable coop. Uh, it's a communist dictatorship, and and it often ends up in mass death. <laughs> but that's on a super small scale, right? There's a difference between communism on the homestead scale, and a difference and communism on the nation state, you know, geographical area spanning four thousand miles. Uh, with when when you're grouped in with the average Walmart shopper, it's a complete different thing. And so, anyways, Bitcoin huge huge contribution to the idea of of anarchism and, and free you know anar anarcho capitalism free marketism whatnot Bitcoin is amazing um of course you have to give precious metals their due as well that's important but but bit metals for the most part are totally distributed by the banks and and, and big institutions whereas Bitcoin is distributed by anybody who wants to use it so Bitcoin just crushes metals in my opinion in I mean, the utility. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not throwing out the, the baby with the bath bathwater. I'm still long metals. I'm 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 into all this stuff. Again, it's all tools in the toolkit. Um, but Bitcoin wins as far as distribution, so much easier and divisibility. Whereas you know, even one ounce silver, let's say silver silver, we go to hyperinflation and silver is now worth two hundred dollars per uh, one ounce coin. Yeah, you can split it up, but that's not easy to do. And that's a pain in the ass. Bitcoin, you can just you can decimalize Bitcoin. I, I forget how, how how low the decimals go, but they say that if Bitcoin's worth a million dollars per full Bitcoin, you'll still be able to buy a loaf of bread with a, a, a divisible uh, amount of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin crushes um, metals in that way, and other cryptos too. But to some degree, not really. I think Bitcoin for me, I'm I'm a I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist now. A couple of years ago, I wasn't, but I've been more convinced. A good friend of mine, Cody Thompson, uh, really kind of convinced me through many conversations that that made the most amount of sense. Jack Spearco would be another one. Um, so as far as, as 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 the whole crypto world goes, I'm just into Bitcoin, really. That's just me. People can make the case for other types of coins, and and, and that's all great. The other idea that was not an anarchist idea, but was complete anarchism in its in its um in its uh utility for my freedom and this might surprise some people but maybe not is the eight forms of capital so i've done videos on the eight forms of capital i've mentioned them in a lot of different uh videos and live streams and the idea of eight forms of capital is so liberating because what it does is it compartmentalizes the idea of capital into eight other forms that you have more than you think you do. And once you kind of go through this process of understanding the eight forms of capital, and I'll do a bit of that right here, um, it's quite liberating actually. And, and, and you'll be able to see how that if you can leverage other forms of capital, they can also lead to one another and they intersect. So different forms of capital can lead to financial capital. Um, and, and the billionaires all know this. And that's why if you read a lot of the books of billionaires, and I've read a, a number of them, um, you know, more, more self-help books written by, you know, Carnegie and stuff like that, or Stephen Covey, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Tony Robbins books, things like that. I read that stuff for years. Um, what billionaires do, they, billionaires have all kinds of ways to not pay taxes and not lose money to inflation because they're all in on inflation. And so they, they want to get into hard assets and physical things. That's why they don't just sit, sit on piles of cash, like communists who always debate you know, people on taxation always say, oh, then the rich are just going to sit on their money. It's like the rich don't do that, you idiot. <laughs> the, the rich will keep some cash available for spending because they're going to need it. 
But for the most part, the rich, the real rich, put all their money into assets. And so what are the eight forms of capital and, and how can they help you? So I've done other videos on this. I'll do, I'll do a little bit on it here, but I think it's important to look at it because from my perspective, it's a really important idea when you're thinking about freedom and liberty and prosperity. So we all know financial, right? Financial is money, currency, any type of monetary instrument, bonds, uh, Bitcoin, any type of instrument within commerce is financial capital, right? So there's all kinds of them. It isn't just the US dollar, right? There's all kinds of mechanisms of finance that can be, that are tradable and, and, and divisible and fungible and all those things that, that give money uh, its, its core characteristics. Financial capital is just one of them. What's the other one? What's another one? Biological capital trees, ecological systems. On my property, I've I've invested heavily into biological capital, hundreds of trees, earthworks to, to um, shed water, to hold water, to store water, um, um, any type of landscaping that I've done to build gardens, you know, planting other types of perennials, all, all kinds of trees. Those are, that's, those are biological capital resources. And so they're, Amazing because you need that shit to live. So biological capital is a form of capital that you can store and use and benefit from that isn't taxed, isn't inflated, and it is self-replicating if you've done things right. If you've looked at a lot of ideas in permaculture and 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 you uh, and just you know good farming practices in general, you found you find ways to self-replicate your systems, and that's what biological capital. Just like if you're really good with finances. Um, you know, as a guy, say Robert Kiyosaki would say, uh, rich dad, poor dad, you know, great book, actually a book I, sh I should have mentioned. Well, I am now rich dad, poor dad, uh, just basically talks about how the rich don't pay taxes and how the rich don't and how the rich, um, move their money and, and, and whatnot. It's, it's really cr critical to understand, but all this information is liberating. And so if you're good in finances, you will get out of the rat race where your income isn't dependent on your labor. And then you have base income that comes in while you sleep, whatever you do. And then you can really start to ratchet yourself up from there. And there's all kinds of different investment ways to do that. That's not my thing to advise you one way or the other, but those are things that you can do. Biological capital is the same thing. You set up systems that start to self-replicate that have passive long-term benefit for many years. Like I'm looking at um, planting hundreds of trees this year, more. I've, I've already planted a lot of trees here, but hundreds more. And now I've got the place to put them. And now I'm looking at planting walnut trees, acorn tree or, or, or oak trees, hazelnut trees, all kinds of trees that in 40 years, my kids will be eating and setting up swings for their kids on, you know, thinking that 40 years down the road. So biological capital, huge. Material capital this is number three. So we have financial, biological, material capital is stuff like equipment, tools, um, buildings, structures, material things that you can create, hold, and that have use in a variety of different ways, right? So that's that one's kind of self-explanatory. Another one is intellectual capital. So the ideas and things that you that you learn and become and, and use skills um, and um, information that benefits you is intellectual capital. And this is why I mean, actually, let me let me I'll go through this and I'll tell you why this is why communism never works is because you can't tax the rest of these things. All you can tax is financial capital and the rich know these things. And so this is why you can never just tax the rich out of oblivion. You could, you could, you could take every, you could take all the income from everybody today and distribute it evenly. And within a week, the same billionaires would be billionaires again. And, and I'll, I'll go, I'll drill a little bit further into that. And part of that reason is, is this is the eight forms of capital. So you got your intellectual capital. That's number four. Again, ideas, skills, things that you learn, knowledge, right? That's, that's useful and powerful. Um, knowledge in any way, right? Intellectual capital is super, super broad. Uh, it's, it's everything to do with information and knowledge and, and, and skills and things that you can, information that can help you. The fifth is experiential capital. This is huge as well. 
the experiences that you gain in your life, the things that you, the, the trials and tribulations you go through, those things make you super powerful, right? Those things enable you experiences. You know, when you have a really big failure, you're like, man, I'm never going to make that mistake again. Experiential capital is huge. And experiential capital, if you're smart and, and you're growing up and you're learning how to listen, experiential capital is super powerful because you can read the books of some people and benefit from their, their their experience without having to make their mistakes. That's where experiential capital is compounding effect. And that's why super rich people always read a lot of books. Hey, thanks for the super chat there, uh, Matthew. He says, thanks for the advice, but all you need to attract crows and ravens, treat tree insects, the woodpeckers will do it. That's great. And there's all kinds of biological systems like that that uh, we could get into, but probably not tonight. But I appreciate that uh, super chat. So experiential capital, right, is, is is your experiences. Social capital are your relationships, right? So they are the 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 compounding and growing goodwill that you put out into the world. And if you're if you're a person who does puts goodwill out to the world, that will come back to you. And if you don't put out goodwill, uh, it's only a matter of time until that comes back to you as well. We all know that. We all know the that that uh, what goes around comes around, right? So social capital is super important. Um, cultural capital next. So cultural capital is the idea that you create cultural practices, institutions, um, days of remembrance, whatever it is, you know, celebrating Christmas, all these things. These are all cultural ideas, cultural things. And they have a capital value, especially when you are formulating a society. And, and, and you can see by the best examples that cultures that have strong cultural um, traditions are far more cohesive, less violent. And so, you know, this is where the mass migration that's going on right now is a complete destruction of cultural capital to the, to the majority of Western society. Because it's a, it's it's a, it's 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 throwing it all in the blender and just hoping to see and just and just seeing how it all self organizes at the end. It's going to be a fucking mess. It already is a mess. So cultural capital is important. I would say it's more important at scale than it is on the small level. Though, on the small level, it has value. Like one example would be, you know, my family. We don't call ourselves Christians, though we are maybe, you know, Christians in some way. I definitely have a lot of reverence for the Bible, uh, but I also have an open mind to other things. And I don't, I choose to just not get hung up on particular things. And for us, it's a spirituality is a, is a personal journey for us. And it's, it's a family thing. And, and, and so on the cultural side of that, we, we, we celebrate Christmas. We have a Christmas tree, right? We, we set, we have traditions within our family. Uh, we, we do grace at the beginning of every dinner, right? These are cultural traditions in our family, but then you can take cultural traditions to say, thinking about the Amish or the Mennonites or the Quakers or groups like this that have cultural traditions that totally benefit their society. And you could scale that up from there and you could, you could say, um, up until maybe the last 20 years, a lot of Western society, I mean, America's cultural traditions have been bastardized for a very long time, but you would say even a country like, um, what's a good example right now? Hungary, a country like Hungary, really holding on to their, uh, and Poland, probably another one, really holding on to their, their um, is it Russian Orthodox that they are there? I forget what they are, forgive me, but they have a strong culture rooted in Christianity and they just haven't opened the floodgates to migration. Look, lo and behold, they don't have any fucking crime. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so all these countries that just open the floodgates to immigration, we now have crime. And, and and there's many complex reasons why there's crime. I'm not just saying it's it's immigration because that's certainly not the case. But it's right now it's certainly adding to the to the to the to the pandemonium. And then lastly, number eight, we have spiritual capital. And this is another one too that that can have varying different applications on scale. So I would say on the micro scale, like the zone zero, the 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 the, the personal journey of spirituality got a lot of people through the COVID racket. You know, having that 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 rooted 
faith in in something, right? God or you know whatever it is. Maybe it's just a strong practice in meditation or you know whatever strong practice in some kind of spirituality. It could be any sect of religion and whatnot. And what we saw during the COVID racket is that groups that had strong spiritual uh, traditions that were also, again, this is where culture intersects with spirituality. Those people kind of stuck together, which, and they helped each other get through. Um, and so spirituality on the personal level also helps you sustain torment. And, you know, read a book like um, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, you know, talking about being in the in the concentration camp and just having that faith uh, that gets you through and and kind of letting go of the past and and accepting where you are as a consequence of your own actions, whether those are rooted in spirituality or not, they are, you know, you, you can make the case that Confucianism is a spiritual practice. And again, people will debate me on this and, and fair enough, maybe another time, but all these things would contribute to your spiritual capital. That's the kind of point I'm trying to make. And then on the larger scale, the spiritual capital that what we're seeing right now is that on a collective basis, there's very little spiritual capital in society because look at how easily people are being duped into dumb things. Like if, and, and, and case in point, the people that have the most amount of faith, in my opinion, were the people that did the best during COVID. They didn't take the shots. They didn't buy into the propaganda. They just kind of stood the course and had faith in, in God and whatever their practice was, and, and they did quite well. So spiritual capital is very valuable. But the thing that's really empowering about the eight forms of capital for me is – a number of things. And I'll kind of just, I don't actually have these written down, but I'll kind of go through and just my gut sense of how they've been empowering for me. And I'll say actually real quick, Mike Murphy, thanks for the super chat there, brother. As always, thank you for your wisdom. Appreciate that. Um, is that when you understand these, only one of these things, well, you can make the case that some, no, there's elements of control in all of these. And actually that might be an interesting conversation. Um, but financial capital for sure is the one that controls us the most in our society because Western society and Western law is rooted in commerce. And so the whole Anglo-American establishment, the city of London, the whole banking system, you know, the United States is a corporation under the 1871 Organic Act after the United States of America formed a, or some people in the United States of America formed a corporation in, in a place called Washington, D.C., a very small geographical area, which is area, which is its own nation state with its own constitution, formed a constitution or, or not a, a constitution, but a doctrine for the rest of the United States, all caps to operate under, which is commerce, uniform commercial code. Uh, the whole the whole legal system, you know. There's my there's my copy of Black's Black's Law's Fifth. It's a pretty badass looking book. Almost looks like a satanic tome, and in many ways it is. Um, but that whole legal system of commerce is built into the financial mechanism as the main point of control for the human population. And so you've heard me riff on this many times. I'm not going to go into the whole straw man thing and all that, but all of that is a mechanism of control. But so it's quite empowering if you understand, and now you can compartmentalize, okay, financial capital is only one method of control. Um, can they control biological capital? In a way, they do by making you eat GMOs and bugs and spraying chemtrails and stuff like that. You can make the case that there's a war against biology and ecocide. I mean, chemtrailing is ecocide, in my opinion. And I'm actually... One little side note, I um, I I did a FOIA to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change in Canada. It's In Canada, we call them Access to Information. It's an Access to Information Act. It's just like a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act in the U.S. And I am getting a USB drive delivered to me by mail because it was too big. The file was too big for them to send me, but I applied for an Access to Information. Um, I uh, am requesting all the records for all the chemtrailing across Canada since 1985. I'm literally being sent that by the Canadian government because I applied for it. I paid $5, went through a little administrative fee, uh, a little administrative service and applied. And I got a nice cordial uh, email two days ago saying, thanks for your application. We're going to send you the file. We're doing our best right now to put, assemble all the information for you and we'll be in touch with you shortly. And I got a, ni a nice another email today and said, hey, look, 
uh, we're putting together these documents and there's just way too many to send you. So can we just mail you a thumb drive? I said, absolutely. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Here's my postal address. So the government of Canada, the environment of Canada is sending me a thumb drive with all of the records, reports, and information regarding geoengineering in Canada since 1985, which is when the Weather Modification Act was put into royal ascent. Okay, so I got that comment. That's a teaser. Uh, stay tuned for that. That's going to be, uh, I'm going to go hardcore with it. And uh, it'll take me a while to pour over the information, but um, I'm stoked to share it with you guys and basically blow the lid off chemtrails that it's legit it's real they do it and it's on the record and the government has all the re reports of all of it and they're sending it to me and i'm going to be sharing it with all of you so that'll be exciting anyways so biological capital can be uh controlled material capital can be controlled to some degree as in they can steal your shit you know uh, uh civil forfeiture as far as property is concerned is real um they can control intellectual capital by propaganda and messaging, right? They can control experiential capital by locking you down, right? And demoralizing you, right? They can control social capital by putting social pressures and creating uh, the fear of ostracism into society. They can control you that way. Uh, control. They control cultural capital by... Uh, um, again, probably more propaganda, but also creating traditions and disavowing traditions. Like look at the, the social justice warriors tearing down the statues, right? It's an assault against the culture. It's an assault against the, the culture that we've had. Uh, and then spiritual uh, assault, absolutely. I mean, this is a spiritual war that we're in really. Uh, and they do that through all kinds of techniques. Demoralization, I actually would even make the case that chemtrails do that just by keeping the skies gray all the time is demoralizing. So um, those are the eight forms of capital. And anyways, those are some of, so what I, what I just outlined here is I talked about Ayn Rand, Stephen Molyneux's books, Bitcoin, eight forms of capital. These are ideas that aren't all necessarily anarchist ideas, though I think they are. Um, they've been incredibly enabling for me because They've had such a profound impact on the way I live my life with my family in business, even and the way I conduct myself and the way I operate, operate in the world. These things have been incredibly empowering to me. Um, I would even add a couple other books too, like um, Think and Grow Rich or How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie in there. Uh, even some of Tony Robbins' work, uh, Money, Master the Game, uh, newer, that's one of his newer books, but these are, these ideas give you power. Like they, these ideas enable you to do something. And I think as we kind of talked about at the beginning with, with definitions is that it is all about freedom, really. Well, that's what we're talking about. So this is where I want to describe, oh, let me just read a quick super chat here. Uh, Danny, thanks for that. How do I navigate running my market garden and network? So I appreciate that. We'll get, I'll answer this question at the end. I'll take a snapshot of it here. So it just doesn't get lost in the feed, but I'll circle back to that. But thank you for the super chat. I don't want it to derail me because I kind of want to do this and then I want to finish this. And then we do our um, our anarchist recovery hotline <laughs> on spaces. So now I want to talk about my journey towards freedom because I think I've laid out, you know, what's been effective, what, what's been valuable for me, the ideas that I like. We talked about the principal ideas of anarchy. What does it mean? And all of that. And uh, and again, my main thesis of all this, we'll circle back to it in the end, is that that for the most part, the ideas of anarchy when it just comes to complaining about the state and asking and 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 talking about a perfect world where we have anarchy is effectively an exercise in futility when you have to deal with the average Walmart shopper. Okay. The average, the average individual who um who uh is uh your voting base or the person you have to come to a consensus with. It's just not going to happen with all these useless eaters, basically, as Klaus Schwab would call them. But um, Fractural Insights, hey, thanks for the $20 super chat. Be careful with the thumb drive, Chris. I'd plug it into a burner. Great. And that was my plan. So absolutely, yes. <laughs> 100% brother. Yeah, there's no malware on there. I'm not worried about that at all, though. Uh, my interaction with the state, and this is going to be part of my journey here that I'm going to explain is that it's so compartmentalized that the big eye of Sauron that you think is up there is not there for the most part. And, and, and it, and it is, 
There, there is a deep state. There is bad motherfuckers out there, no question. But for the most part, unless you're waking up the sheep or telling where Hillary Clinton has the bodies buried, the state will not neutralize you. And also, if you're not playing a political game, and this is why I always talk about there's politics, there's administration, and then there's the law. Go in the law. Use the law. Know your definitions, right? Know your definitions. Know your maxims of equity. Know you have to know your enemy. Know thy enemy, right? This is this is Sun Tzu, the art of war. And this is where this conversation is going to get towards this, this, this side of practicality. So I had all these anarchist ideas and principles and all these things, but it was like, what do I do with this stuff? It's great, but I can't vote this in. You can't, you can't really vote a libertarian party in because there's too many useless leaders. There's too many people that are dependent on the state. They'll never vote for it. And so how else do you create it? I don't, I don't think it's possible, frankly. But anyways, I had a thing that um, happened to me in 2014 that really pissed me off. So I bought a house in 2014 with a mortgage, with a mechanism of financial control. But I used that mortgage to get out of that mortgage, sold that house for a decent profit and and moved to a cheaper location here, built a homestead. You know, that's a big part of my journey. Um, but in 2014, I had skin in the game because I bought a home and, you know, uh, was working on it and renovating it and updating it uh, with the idea of making it the best place to grow a family. But then when 5G came out uh, during COVID, I was like, I absolutely will not live in the city anymore. And that was the final straw. We left. But in 2014, the city was part of a big racket with the, the power utility, Fortis Power, and they were putting smart meters on homes. And smart meters emit quite a bit of electromagnetic frequency. I would say an unhealthy amount of them. However, if you have it on the opposite end of your house, it's not going to be nearly as detrimental to your health health as if it's right next to your bedroom. And so you can, you know, there's ways around these things. I'm not going to open the whole can of worms with smart meters, but basically I got involved in a smart meter campaign to get them off our homes with a gentleman named Cal Washington. And Cal was my first mentor with the law. And the first thing I did with him was I was I was part of a class action notice of liability, basically, that we were noticing Fortis, the corporation, that their smart meters were causing us harm. And we were coming after individuals in that corporation for massive amounts of money. And we put a massive amount of legal pressure without any lawyers on these guys. And the CEO resigned the next day. This was in 2014. You can look it up. Did it end the smart meter campaign? No, it didn't. But it was the first thing that I saw the power of the law. And I was going, holy shit, like this worked. 200 people sent registered mail to this asshole and the guy resigned the next day. That's something. Like it wasn't the silver bullet. It's not, it wasn't really what we all wanted, but it was, wow, there's something here. So that began my job, uh, journey into the law. And now we're 10 years because this happened winter of, of, of 2014. Um, I believe it was in the new year too. So it's, it's been officially, uh, it's been officially, um, 10 years for me in my journey to law. And that's where it began with Cal Washington. And I didn't do a ton. I did a lot of reading for the next couple of years, kind of got continually pissed off about issues. Um, and again, it was a lot of those, the, the, the fact that I was pissed off stemmed from the fact that I wasn't executing in my life as best as I could because I was letting these things control my life and I wasn't getting remedy. So I had the Canadian Food Inspection Agency came, come after me in 2016. So I've told this story before. I'll tell it briefly here. And it's, I don't like to tell the legal remedy stories in public because there's, there's risk to that. But I tell the ones that haven't seemed to cause me any grievances. And so, um, will I talk about taxes and things like that in a YouTube live stream? Never, not in, not in your wildest imagination or dreams. Um, these things have to be discussed in private. And that's the rule. That's the unspoken rule. I've said, um, uh, I said a, a Twitter uh, post the other day, I said, uh, if you want to live without rules, you have to first understand, if you want to live without rulers, you have to first understand the rules. And what I meant by that is kind of like Sun Tzu and the art of war, or just like an MMA fighter is that if you want to go up against something or someone, if you don't understand the techniques and the, the things, the tools they're using to 
to compromise you and hurt you, you're at a disadvantage. So you're in, so you might not like the law. You might not like the statute law system and think it's bullshit. If you're like a guy like, um, Mark Passio, who I like, and I, I have a lot of respect for, and I enjoy his content. Um, but Mark just talks about how fucked things are. And, and a lot of content creators too. Like, uh, somebody mentioned earlier, um, what's his name? Brian from high impact flicks. Cool guy. I like him. I like his content. Um, at the same time, he seems to just be complaining about nothing. Like he's complaining about something that he has no agency over. So it's like, what's the fucking point? And I even called him out in a friendly way. I was like, Brian, you don't even have a garden, bro. Like I'm looking at your videos and you got, you got a lawn. Like where's the garden, dude? Like start putting some of this anarchy into practice, right? Like if you want to, if you want freedom and you understand, say the eight forms of capital, you need to work towards freedom. I'm not saying everybody has to have a garden, but it's like, dude, if you're going to, if the loudest voices that complain about this stuff, don't do anything about it. And that this is kind of what, what drives me kind of crazy about the, some of those, those folks in the libertarian anarchist space is that if you're just talking about politics and political mishaps and and uh political corruption yet and at the same time you're advocating for a a, a a no state you're barking up a tree like you're bark like it'll never happen because you're just complaining about politics there's an implementation to in, in your life and i'm going to get to that gravy i hope i can finish this in the next 15 minutes i don't know if i can i might have to push it a little closer to eight but that's okay that's how these things go. So anyways, 2016, I had the Canadian Food Inspection Agency come after me. And at that time, I'd already been consulting in agriculture for three or four years. Like I, I started farming in 2010 and I was pretty good at it right away as people saw in my videos. I, I found a little niche in farming and, and got good at it right away and people wanted my help. And so I was consulting all over the world. And I had, I had been in many consulting sessions where I had seen agencies of the government, which are all just service corporations, but I'd seen agents, agencies come in and destroy farms. And this is common. This happens all the time, whether the raw milk people or, or, or whatever, any sector of agriculture, the, the more, the, the more involved it is with animals, the more it's regulated typically. But uh, I even saw it with microgreens. So they, they came after me regarding microgreens in 2016. And they sent me a letter saying, uh, actually sent me an email um, which is, which is telling because if they would have sent me something registered mail, it probably would have had more weight just kind of demonstrating how so much of this stuff has no, it's just bullshit. Uh, but anyways, they sent me a, a, an email saying, Hey, we're going to come and inspect your farm on this date and you better be there with all your employees. And we're going to go through your procedures. And we, we, we hear that you're growing microgreens there. And those are under, under article, blah, blah, blah. These are considered a high risk crop. Therefore we need to come and regulate you because you're not responsible enough to manage it yourself. Though I've was completely never had any issues with anything and was selling to grocery stores and had a very successful business growing microgreens for many years, year round. And so my, my, my lessons with Cal up until that point had now come to test. Uh, and so what was tested is that my foundational knowledge that the state is nothing but a service corporation and I've done so many streams on that. We're not going to get into that, but it is. It's a fact. It's a bona fide fact, and it's provable. It's provable in law. And people say, well, good luck taking that to court. It's like, why would you take it to court? It's a fact. <laughs> why would I go to court to prove the government's a corporation when it is a corporation? And they'll admit that. It's it's a corporation. And that's not even that controversial because the, the what, what people who would say normalize that statement, what they'll say is that you need corporations to get into the system so that you can have budgets and expenses and borrow money and all that. And that's exactly true and correct. And it's they can make it sound benign, but it's not benign because it's totally rooted on your birth certificate. Governments don't pay for things from taxation directly. They borrow money at interest by leveraging your bond on your birth certificate so that they, they can go to the international banks and say, hey, I got all these slaves with all these birth certificates. What do you give me for 30 years of their labor? And they'll say, well, we'll give you this. And so that's how borrowing money works in a really, you know, oversimplified way. But uh, that that's what they do. And so I knew this at a foundational level. And so if you understand that governments are corporations, what's the difference between Walmart and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency? Well, really, nothing, actually, nothing. 
uh, except that because they're an agency that has the ability to bring in force, though it would take a lot of fucking around for um, the CFIA to result in some kind of force on you physically where they're kicking down your door. I would make the case that in the U.S. that's far more common than it is in Canada because you don't, you just don't, and that's why the state, the U.S. is probably the most communist government in the world is because the implementation of force is the greatest in the U.S. Like how many, you know, world's largest prison population, right? Like you go on this forever. I don't mean to, to, to say this to degrade Americans. That's not, that's not the case at all. It's to just call out what the real issue is. But anyways, they are that. And so when you get to a level of coercion with the state, you've done a lot of things wrong, basically. Um, but again, it comes down to understanding the rules of engagement. And that's why I say, if you want to live without rulers, you have to first understand the rules. And so the rules of the game are commerce. That we live in a world of money created under the British Anglo-American Zionist establishment, central banking cartel establishment, all going back up to the Vatican, the city of London as the administrator, and all of this in Washington, D.C. as the uh, executor or the enforcer of the U.S. dollar, right? Without the U.S. military presence in the world, the U.S. dollar has no value. It's, 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 it's money. It, it, the, the, the dollar is backed, on, backed by guns. It's no longer backed by gold. It's backed by guns. It was backed by gold up until Bretton Woods, but now it's backed by guns. So anyways, but going back to my story is that once you understand the state is nothing but a service corporation that has that 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 tacitly took away not took away tacitly offered you privileges and benefits in exchange for your god-given rights and that's the sort of dichotomy of where we are in the united states with the idea of the du jour state which is the united states of america the decentralized 51 states that formed a simple union but all had their own constitutions then the idea of the de facto state, which is the corporate state, which was the biggest hoodwink that's ever been perpetrated on America, was the formation of D.C. and the United States Service Corporation that took all your birth certificates into a registrar and then basically created a big money scam out of it. And then the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913 fully realized that. Though they tried to do many different things between 1871 and 1913, as if you know your history, they, there are many different incarnations of different banks and people were shooting them down and saying, hell no, hell no, we're not doing that. But eventually the Federal Reserve System came up and that's as we know it. That's the big scam of it all. But if you understand again at a fundamental level, what the state is, that it is commerce and it is all about money, well, then you can accept or not accept an offer. And in law, again, if you want, if you, if you don't want rulers, you have to know the rules. In law, there's four doors of ways to interact with the state. There's four doors. And this all, this all comes down to if they come at you with an offer. So it's different if you're just coming to them, like I am applying for a Freedom of Information Act for all the information on chemtrails, that's something different. I'm talking about if the state comes at you as something, you have four doors of interaction. The first door is acceptance. Okay, I can accept the terms and do your do your will. I can deny, and deny is dangerous in law because it gets you into a form of belligerence where the state will consider you belligerent and you'll end up either in a prison or a psych ward. And so you have to be very careful with how you deny. There are times you can deny. And... Uh, if you do deny, you just need to make sure you are really in the right with, and the law is on your side. So you can deny. Uh, but for the most part, you don't want to deny because it will bring back another level of force. It's like denial is like um, pissing the vampire off. So the vampire knocks on the door. And there's sort of this allegory of the vampire of... The, the 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 and it's 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 a it's an analogy of the state in my opinion is the vampire knocks on the door and the rule of the vampire is it can't suck your blood unless you invite it in so it comes and it's charming and and it's it's charming you and needs to come in and you can choose to let it in and if you did you're dead and so the state in a way is a similar way that they need your uh consent and it is about consent it really all is because in order to do commerce you need consent you need a contract you need and in that contract you have to have disclosure you have to have a meeting of the minds and then you have to have compensation that's how you engage in commerce by and large more or less and so you have to have those things and so again you can deny 
or you can go silent. That's what the cops tell you. You, you have the right to remain silent. Any any um, thing you say or do can can uh, can and will be used against you in a court of law. They're giving you notice. Uh, going silent for the most part is to tacitly agree because when the government comes at you with something, it says if you don't respond to this in this many days, then this and this will happen. And and uh, that happened in that letter that they sent me. And then the last thing is the gravy, is the conditional acceptance, is to accept the conditions, accept the terms on conditions. And 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 in the case, this was my biggest turning point, falling out of love with anarchy, is that I realized, holy shit, I can get remedy in the system. It seems to work. If I if if, if I base that opinion entirely on what I see on the news, I would come to the conclusion that Brian at at uh, High Impact Flicks has about it is that it's all fucked and there's nothing you can do. And it's just not an empowering, useful, I know he's a dad, like he's got a family and stuff. Like it, for, to me, that's just not, in my position, probably similar to his, is it's just not a useful outlook. <laughs> it doesn't It doesn't get me anything. All it does is go Meh, on Twitter and I just fucking complain about how shitty things are and it's not elevating my life. And in fact, it's probably... It's pumping the misery algorithm. That's kind of what I hate. I have this love-hate thing with social media is that it seems to me that social media across the board just encourages negative engagements. Like I'm on Twitter having really, I think, quite high level and interesting conversations with people and and, and making interesting connections and it's all amicable. I, if I if there's like trolls or losers like in Owen Benjamin's cult, I just block them. Like I don't I don't need to talk to these losers who just have stupid ideas and just make gay jokes so i just i'm not in there but social media encourages that kind of thing and so i i just don't go there and so i can see why guys like brian and michael malice not to discredit them because i i actually like them I, I like their content and i agree with everything they have to say i just i just go dude where's your fucking garden where's your compost where's your chickens like what what are you doing you live in like some shitty suburb like, are you crazy? Don't you see what the new world order is doing? You report on it every day. Like, where's the fucking action, dude? And so that that's that's where I differentiate myself from those guys. But again, in in, in all goodwill, like I'd love to debate Brian. He, I don't think I have enough Twitter followers for him to care, though. Unfortunately, um, <laughs> I told him I'd like, hey, come on my YouTube channel. I got I got more subscribers than you do. Uh, but he hasn't taken me up on that offer. Anybody knows him, plug him and t dude, let's debate. I'd love to have a conversation with you. He might not want to though because he might realize what I'm saying is like his Achilles heel. <laughs> and it might be for Michael Malice too. I'd love to talk to Michael Malice, but I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. But it is their Achilles heel in my opinion is that these guys aren't doing shit. It's like, where's where's the fucking garden, dude? Like, where's the homestead? Yeah, you might have lots of guns. That's good. That's one thing. But like, where's the other stuff? Where's the eight forms of capital? So anyways, um, you, so when, where did I go? Well, I kind of went on a little tangent talking about those guys. But basically, um, at this point, so going back to the, the food inspection agency, I basically gave them a conditional acceptance and it worked. To make a long story short, I've told this story many times before. I won't need to go to full detail again, but it worked. I got remedy. And I was like, holy shit. And and this was right around the time my oh, my wife was pregnant with my daughter there. And we were she was getting uncomfortable sleeps and I was getting uncomfortable sleeps because I was worried for six months they were going to come back at me. Seriously. I just wasn't sure, but they never did. So that began my falling out of love with the idea of anarchy because I'm sitting here going, well, for one, anarchy is physically impossible in any, in, if society is at any resemblance as it is today, let's say go back to the 1980s, it still would have been impossible because the average Walmart shopper doesn't give a shit about your anarchy. The average Walmart shopper wants free stuff and deals on bags of chips and and cheap, accessible everything so that they can live the most hedonistic uh, and uh, self-indulgent lifestyle as humanly possible. And that's where we're at. So how the hell are those people going to become anarchists? So I started to fall out of love with it because I'm just going like, I look at the news, I listen to, if I listen to Brian, if I only listen to Brian, if I only listen to Michael Malice or whatever people are listening to, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. I don't follow a ton of people on Twitter cause I don't, I get information from other places than, than Twitter, but um, there is a, a lot of ideas out there and they're fucking useless unless you're actually doing shit against the state. And this is where this, it, it starts to really annoy me 
is that we're here, you guys. Like the new world order is here. This is it. We're in the trenches now. And it's not getting better. Like they're they're dialing it up. And so it's um if you're not gonna do something, you're nuts. Like you're nuts. What are you thinking? And so that's where I, I depart from it and why I called this stream Confessions of a, of a Recovering Anarchist is because I don't, I'm an anarchist in, in philosophy. I'm with you. I'm there. Michael Malice, love your, I love your hypothesis. I love your critiques of the state. I pretty much agree with everything he says, except his elephant in the room and same for Brian um at high impact flicks and and a lot of these folks uh in the free in the libertarian anarchist space is like dude where's the garden where how come you're not thinking about your eight forms of capital how come you're not how can you be living in austin texas with all this madness going on like why would you want to do that don't you see don't you believe it's where it's where you know, a guy like Nassim Taleb, also another great intellectual. Actually, I could have mentioned him too. Shit. Anti-fragile, you know, black, the black swan, um, fooled by randomness, um, incredible books. That guy got totally woke during COVID though. I don't know what happened to him, but uh, his books were also really important, I think, for the ideas of anarchy and thinking about just a, a free market and, and the best way to survive and thrive and prosper, you know, because for me, it's all about, it's three things kind of fundamentally as when I think about freedom and, and, and what I want in life. I want freedom, liberty, and prosperity. And so, you know, the pursuit of happiness and, and, and property and all that stuff in the American Constitution, that's all great too. Pursuit of happiness is bullshit. Um, it's, uh, they, just, they just threw that in to get rid of property because it used to just be property. It was, uh, what, what, what were the original three for America? Anyways, it's not important to my thesis, but somebody might pop it into the chat. Um, uh, is it freedom, justice, and the pursuit of happiness? What is that? What it is? But anyways, it's supposed to be property, and they took that out when they took all your birth certificates and basically created the commercial society, um, which is the scam. And that's why if you're not figuring out, and th this is where these guys kind of bug me, is that, and I've even reached out to some of them privately to be like, hey, dude, like man to man in the private. I'll I'll help you with some questions you might have about finding freedom in the state because I've figured out a lot of this stuff and I don't share it publicly, but you know I'll do it privately. Like I do consulting sessions for people with this shit all the time now, and I'll direct them into into the places that the answers that they're looking for. I'm not going to write your remedies and stuff, but I'll help people find. You know, I had a guy saved him probably ten years of searching one call, just like you know. Anyways, I'll reach out to people the odd time. Uh, amazing Paul is another one. I, I I like her, and you know I like her her critiques and comments. Uh, and she doesn't proclaim to be an anarchist, so I'm not holding her feet to the fire. Um, but you know, there's answers for these people. But to me, it almost seems like they would just rather go nah! online and just and just fucking fight with people. It's like. Brian and, and Owen Benjamin had a tiff now. And I tried to warn him, like, dude, don't even, it's not even worth your time. He's he's a cult leader. Like, he's just going to make up lies about you. And of course, now he is. And he Owen, of course, expectedly, you know, started talking shit about the guy's family and his wife and stuff. And it's like, dude, so it's like, why bother? That's just not, that's not the realm of, um, you know, reasonable civilized conversation. It's just, it's just garbage. Um, but I think some people, Honestly, and it might be subconscious because the algorithm, and I kind of talked about this uh, in my last video or one of my last videos is how the algorithm is actually another method that is controlling us in the form of our social capital, our cultural capital, and our experiential capital, and, and actually our financial capital. The algorithm is controlling four metrics of the eight forms of capital because it incentivizes you to behave in ways that you probably wouldn't want to normally. Like if the out, if you didn't get more clicks and retweets and views and likes and ad revenue by 
not just creating a velocity and volume of content, why would you do it? You just do something else that made more sense. So, oh, for example, it's a it's own fact that clickbait gets clicks. And there's like the old saying, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Like you, you've probably all heard that before. If it bleeds, it leads. Oh, I'm just going to pause for a second because I see the stream is lagging a bit there. Sorry about that, folks. So if it bleeds, it leads. It means that bad news sells better than good news. And, and, and everybody kind of knows that, especially if you've watched mainstream media, you know, for any part of your adult life. It's, it, if it bleeds, it leads. Drama, bad news, tragedies sell news. They also sell the algorithm. And so it's, tr it's a tragedy that social media has become the same piece of garbage in a way as far as accentuating human behavior, the worst of human behavior, as mainstream media did. It really did. In a way, it actually decentralized it. You ever heard that quote? Um, it's a really good one. It's uh, from Andy Warhol. You know who Andy Warhol is? Came out of the, the Dada art movement in New York. You know, um, Lou Reed and, and the Velvet Underground and, and 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 those artists like Yoko Ono and Jackson Pollock that all it all came it started as this. I think they called it Dada uh, uh, pop art. Then it turned into avant garde and conceptual art and stuff like that. And a whole bunch of pretentious BS, in my opinion. But Andy Warhol was very prophetic in the comment he made, and it's probably because he was part of the club. Uh, but he had a quote. You can look it up on Google or whatever search engine, and it says, in the future, everybody will be famous for 15 minutes. And that is so profound in our enslavement because the pursuit of the algorithmic um, favor is the selling of your soul. And I know a lot of content creators because I am one, but I took a different path. Like I, I don't, I don't, I barely make any money on YouTube anymore. I'm not demonetized, but I'm shadow banned. Like my videos don't get views based on uh, my uh, subscriber count. And that's fine because I, I found another way to make money as a content creator. And that's to actually create valuable content for people that helps them uh, either make money or achieve goals on their homestead or their land. And that's what freedomfarmers.com is all about. Um, and we have that offer, that 50% offer. It's in the show notes if you if you want to check that out. But that's that's how I make a living as a content creator. I don't have to go and crank algorithms and seek drama with people to get to make money. I don't depend on that. And so I'm I have I, and, I, and I did that intentionally. In 2018, I saw because I had been a content creator since 2014. I I, I started YouTube officially on. Uh, like new, maybe it might've been New Year's Day or January 2nd or 3rd of 2014. So I've been officially a YouTuber and content creator for 10 years. And I saw in 2018, before I started from the field.tv that I just didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be a vlogger or somebody who just always had to have a camera in our face. I didn't want to have to sell out my family and put my kids and my wife in my videos, put her ass on the thumbnails. I didn't want to do that shit. And nor did I want to accentuate the algorithm by just always being on there and just cranking um, engagement. But that's what that stuff does. So I kind of wonder, and I'm not accusing any of these individuals of that, but it might be subconscious for them, is that in in order to be a content creator, as most people understand, again, it's not the case in my situation, but as most people understand, you just have to crank the algorithm. And the algorithm does whatever it does. And so you just have to do whatever the algorithm is. And if you're on Twitter or X and you want to know what to do for the algorithm, you're following Alex Flynn, you know, and, 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 you're, and you're just whatever he's saying you do on X, you're doing. I'm not doing that. I look at his stuff, I follow him, I find it interesting, but I just don't have it in me. Like, to get to get to crank up my Twitter account or X account, I just have to be on there engaging all the time. And I have a fucking homestead. I have a family. Like I have shit to do. And I also have real things that I do. Like, for example, things that move the needle. Like how I just filed a FOIA to get all the chemtrail geo uh, geoengineering documents from all of Canada since 1985. I'm getting that sent to me. That's action. I'm doing something. I actually had to spend, to do that, I had to spend three hours on the phone. Uh,
do things. I like to actually needle as far as freedom. And that's where, again, I depart from this whole idea of just talking about anarchy and talking about how the, the way the world ought to be and actually do shit. And, and looking at that lens of some of those things I painted at the beginning, like peaceful parenting, Stefan Molyneux's ideas, even some of the ideas in practical anarchy, uh, ways to self-organize without coercion. Um, and, uh, um, and then looking at the eight forms of capital using Bitcoin, you know, it's important using other forms of currency, other forms of, of, of stuff like that. But then having your own, uh, self-replicating biological, you know, agrarian bunker. <laughs> that's, that's Joel South and coined that term agrarian bunker. Um, but that's, that's what I'm doing. Right. And that's what I'm surprised that mo most other of these truthers or so-called anarchists aren't doing. It's like, dude, are you just cranking the algorithm? Like, are you just here to make content? Like, and that's the thing where I go, where do you draw, when you look at somebody's content or information and they've got lots of great stuff, but they don't walk the talk. Like where, where is the freedom? So like Michael Malice, again, I, I respect these guys that I'm mentioning. I'm not here to shit talk them. I, I respect these guys. I don't respect Owen Benjamin for the record, but, but I do respect Brian at High Impact Flex, Flicks, and I do respect uh, Michael Malice, Stefan Molyneux, all these guys. High respect for them. Uh, I'm kind of inviting them to be like, hey, dude, maybe you should look at this. Maybe you should consider this. Maybe you should consider that if you recognize the New World Order doing all these things that it's doing, that maybe you start putting your money where your mouth is, and maybe you start actually walking the talk and doing something. And, and and that will have a really compounding effect because to see guys like that do that, I think would turn a lot of people's minds around because I don't know, I feel like I'm beating a dead drum as far as my level of influence to tell people like, get on the land, get out of the cities, start growing your own food, ha control your own water, have backup power. You know, what are you going to do when the lights go out? What are you going to do when you can't get food at the grocery store? What are you going to do? Because you, if you want to see the bad side of anarchy, as sort of illustrated in Black's Law uh, Dictionary, fifth edition uh, definition that I started with at the beginning of the stream, is the the first part of that was, um, this is actually interesting. This is actually really uh, cool to kind of circle back to this, is that there's a good side to anarchy and there's a bad side to anarchy. And so if you want to experience the bad side of anarchy and you don't have prepared food and backup power and an independent water source or storage of water or things that can just help you survive when the shit starts to hit the fan you're going to feel the bad side of anarchy which is the absence of government the uh, state of society where there is no law or supreme power lawlessness or political disorder destructive uh, dis uh destructive of and confusion in government at least uh and then the, at best doesn't matter because that's just how the world ought to be if everything was perfect and we didn't have to deal with the average Walmart shopper. And then it would be great, but we don't. And so if you don't have the implication of freedom, what are you doing? And so there's five things that I want to propose. And I've done another video about this in the past. And I call it the five metrics of freedom as how I measure freedom. And there are things that you need to have in order to get freedom. And they're all sort of measurable, just like my crop value rating system. If you've ever read my book, The Urban Farmer, kind of five metrics on how to evaluate a crop, if whether it's profitable for your farmer or not. But it, it, as far as these go, these are five things that you need in order to be free, in my opinion. So the first thing, the number one thing is mindset. You have to have the mindset. And I think a lot of Stuff like Ayn Rand and all that helps with the mindset, the mindset of freedom. Where do you, where does that come from? And then the desire to pursue freedom. And I would say a lot of content creators that call themselves anarchists and, and free market people are stuck in the mindset thing because they're not past the desire to actually do something about it. They're just stuck in a loop of algorithmic masturbation where it's just like, hey, look at this thing government did today. Isn't that shitty? Hey, wouldn't it be better if if we all thought this way? Hey, uh, look at Biden today. Like all the just garbage doom scrolling shit. It's just like I can only pay so much attention to it. But a lot of these guys aren't past that mindset because they're still stuck in negative purgatory, which the algorithm wants to keep you in so that you just 
perpetuate the algorithm and just keep people in this funnel of complaining about the world instead of doing anything about it, right? So the mindset has to elevate to the point where you say, okay, now I want to seek the knowledge. Knowledge is number two. Now I want to seek the knowledge to figure out how do I get free? That's for me was my journey into the law. Again, if you want to live without rulers, you first have to understand the rules. And so that was huge for me. And it's still a journey. I'm 10 years into it and, I, and I'm learning more all the time because I actually do stuff. I write letters. I engage. I engage the law. I engage the state through the administration. I don't engage politics. Politics is sports ball. Oh, it's the, it, the Chicago Bears. It's the oh, Chicago Bears. You know, it's just like, it's dumb shit. Politics is dumb. It's a corporate state managed by bankers. Politics is no remedy. So just like move past it and go right into commerce, go right into the, go right into the system, into the tools that they use to control you, understand those tools and use them to free yourself. That's the knowledge. Then third, it's resources. You need resources to be free. And unfortunately, that means if you're stuck in a dead end job and you're not making any money and you're stuck in the rat race, it's going to be harder to attain freedom. So you have to go back get the mindset, get the knowledge and find ways to accumulate resources and understanding the eight forms of capital is a huge step. Reading a book like Robert Kiyosaki's uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, crucial. Get out of the understanding, get in the rat race, start making some money, get your, magnify your skills, it, you know, improve yourself, get up early, crush, do it every day, repeat, you know, that's how you get resources. And you need resources to be free. If I didn't have the money to buy this land that I'm on now, that I own with no mortgage, no debt, no nothing, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as free as I am now. But I had to have the mindset, the knowledge, to, and the skills you know, with the knowledge to get the resources to get here. Then fourth, it's the place. In, in, the, in the video I did about this before, it was the geography. But I, 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 I've kind of boiled it down to the place is that the place you're in, whether it's a micro place or a macro place. So some anarchists, like my buddy Jeff Berwick, his solution is to just go to Mexico and, and all the power to him. That's fine. And Jeff, to his credit, is also starting a big off-grid ranch inspired by me. And so, and he'll tell you that. Um, but that was his solution. So he took a place outside in a different political jurisdiction. Whereas I said, I can exist here because I can understand the rules of engagement. And then I can create my own place where I have my own, like my property is essentially like a compound. And 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 I'm doing way more than the average person should do. And, and that's okay. Cause that's what I want to do. I want to just absolutely crush it at this thing. Cause that's who I am. That's what I like to do. I want to set an example that can inspire you. Don't look at what I'm doing and get butthurt about the fact that you don't have that much shit. Just go, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Darren, thank you for the super chat as always, my brother. And yes, the, the, the Wi-Fi timer is all good. So we're, we're good, brother. Um, but so the place is important because even in a liberal leftist jurisdiction politically, if it's a low population density country like the US and Canada in parts, you can move to a, a, an area that has less people and, 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 and establish freedom as far as your place without leaving the jurisdiction of the nation. Or you can go to a, you can go to Costa Rica, you can go to Nicaragua, you can go to El Salvador, El Salvador, whatever, right? There's there's all kinds of solutions, and they're as complicated as you are. The context is all about you. And lastly, the political side of it. And this one, if I ever write this stuff into my next book, I might amalgamate political with place. But in my original thesis that I presented with this, it was considering the politics of the nation state you're in, because. You, you could you could make a pretty strong case that there are some countries that you, you could be in where you just cannot attain freedom. And I would say, you know, North Korea would be one of those. Um, but there's not that many others, to be honest. I mean, Palestine, if you're born in Palestine, you're, you're fucked, you know, like um, not much you can do, um, you know. So but, you know, besides some of those examples and maybe some more extreme countries in the Middle East, um, even China, you can be free in China, man. China's more capitalist than the United States is now. My cousin's lived there for like 15 years. He loves it. Um, so, so the, the politics of the side is the last part of it that you might have to pick the political jurisdiction. But also in that, I would add that if you understand and can compartmentalize the idea of politics from the government, that's also a very liberating feeling. And again, that's where I go back to this idea of recognizing the state for what it is, not thinking about what you learn in you know high school poli sci of oh you've got the executive branch of the government. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about there's politics, which is the rhetoric, which is the 
politicians that are all just in it for their own political career, except the odd one here and there. And it's just a bunch of bullshit. It's a bunch of rhetoric. Politics moves glacial. It it actually affects the law in a in a in a in a fairly slow way. Uh, though some, of course, some recent examples we can see in the United States um, and perhaps Canada to some degree are changing that. But it does take time. So there's the politics, the administration, which is the apparatus of the physical state as it as it exists, the buildings, the people that work for it, the the operations, the 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 the, the budgetary expenses, all of that. The apparatus of it is the administration, and then there's the law, which is the gravy, right? Right? Legal maxims. Understand? Know your maxims of equity. Equity is the gateway into remedy in law. It's the gateway. You understand equity, you understand everything, in my opinion. Because if you understand equity, you know where to get the gravy. Because you understand the foundational principles of how Western law is created and is all based on that off equity. And all, all kinds of other stuff too. The history of law is very complicated and, and, and there's a lot to it. But uh, we have equity in Canada, all across Canada, and we have, you have equity all across the United States. And that's just one form of, of remedy in the U.S. The U.S. is a neat system because the de facto and the de jure exist simultaneously. And so you can get your status corrected in the U.S. That's a real deal, man. I know people that do it. That's a real deal. So, But again, those five metrics, mindset, knowledge, resources, place, and the politics of understanding – getting a realistic agnostic perspective of what it is because i would say anarchists get hung up on ideology and just jargon um the same as people that buy into cults or people that um um worship the state even the idea the ideology of anarchism is often this worshiping this idea of a utopia like michael malice you know he says you know we could have anarchy and all these things could work so well, but it's like, again, he's not factoring in the average Walmart shopper. So it's the utopia. And, and, and that down to human desire is, is infinite, but resources are limited. Stefan Molyneux actually, I don't know if he coined that term, but I don't think he did, but I heard him say it a lot and that's where I heard it the most. But so, so the system is so flawed because human nature is flawed and human nature is so bastardized after so many years of a gravy train of the Anglo-American establishment, Zionist military regime, militarizing the world so that Americans and North Americans and Westerners in general get the benefit of, you know, colonialism in the most literal sense, just absolute plunder of the rest of the, the, the rest of the world. So, yeah, that's that's my thesis, guys. Basically, that's it. You know, what's the point of talking about anarchy if you're not talking about the practical stuff? Now, when we go into the space at eight, I hope to get into more of that. And 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 it's an anarchist recovery hotline. Derek Bros, brother from uh, Dallas, Texas, is going to be on the line. He'll be chiming in. A uh, really great guy. Ran for Dallas mayor. Um, but he does, I think Derek considers himself an anarchist. That's at least the context I under, I know him in. Um, but he's a disruptor, right? Like, I don't think he, I mean, maybe he thought he was going to get elected mayor, but a lot of these guys that run for politics don't necessarily care if they get elected. They just want to bring ideas to the table that so they get heard. And I think that's powerful. And so, again, it's where some of us are, some some of us who call ourselves anarchists are kind of in this recovery phase. Because like, I don't know if I am an anarchist. I wouldn't call myself a statist. At the same time, I'm using it all the time. Uh, do I like it? No. Do I like the state? No. It's my enemy. But if I don't understand the rules of engagement, I'm just going to get the shit kicked out of me. It's like going to go and fight George St. Pierre, one of my favorite w uh, uh, WWF <laughs> UFC fighters. I love that guy. Um, real French-Canadian, incredible fighter. Uh, going to fight him and not radically studying his technique. You would be a fool to do that, right? And so it's the same thing with the state. So you might not like the state. You might have all kinds of qualms about it and you can complain about it until you're blue in the face, but what the fuck are you doing about it? Are you learning anything about the rules of engagement? Are you getting out of the city? Are you, are you freeing yourself from the confines of the way the state controls you in many different ways? We talked about that when we went through the eight forms of capital. There's so many different ways that they control us through even those things. And so if you're not aware of them, how are you going to liberate yourself from them? 
if you're not aware of your slavery, how can you actually free yourself? So yeah, that's my thesis, folks. Um, that's my, that's my, uh, those are my thoughts. I'll, I'll look at some super chats here and, uh, then we'll shut this down pretty quick. I'm going to go and reload the wood stoves in my cabin and here probably take a piss and then we'll jump into the space. I got my brother Smith, uh, who's down in Honduras right now co-hosting and he's always a good time. So if you guys, um, actually, maybe I'll just share it with you. I, I know a lot of you folks have actually come over to X Twitter recently because of me and, that's that's flattering and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm not getting a kickback from Mr. Musk or anything like that. And frankly, my faith in uh, on Mr. Musk is uh, <laughs> well. I never had any faith in him to begin with. I mean, I just I use his products and that, that's all it is. But after seeing him go and do that little dog and pony show in uh, in Israel, I was uh, I was a little uh, underwhelmed, so to speak. But here's the space, and uh, let me just copy it here and put it in the chat and uh i'll just kind of spam the chat go to the space go to the space uh, at eight o'clock we'll be doing that i invited jack but he's uh yeah he's he's burnt all good bro i invited a bunch of the gooses actually um and actually shit xavier hawk he might show up he's been kind of showing up to some of the spaces um but we'll have Derek bros in the chat tonight i invited john bush too but he said he had some stuff going on uh, but he might pop in. So that's what we're going to do at eight. And quick super chats here. Oh, let's get, we had brother, uh, where is it here? Da, 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 da. Danny P, how do I navigate running my market garden in network of peers who have value, who value a relativistic worldview that prioritizes trendy social causes over objective virtues. It's a cancer here in Australia. Dude, that is the question of the day. And I'm sorry that it took me so long to get to that, Danny, but thanks for the super chat either way. Um, fuck, man. I mean, those five things that I just mentioned, I think could be a guide in, in some ways. I wouldn't be surprised if this chat gave you a lot of solutions before your question there, but I mean, you have to change your scene, dude. Um, you're not going to evangelize people at this day and age. You have to change your scene. So I don't know. That might be might mean moving. That might be getting into a different vertical of a genre of clientele or products or fuck. It's a broad question. I could go on for a long time, but that's what I would say to that. Um, and then we had uh, Macbeth, twenty bucks. Great conversation. Thank you, Macbeth. Um, and then we had, uh, what else have we got here? Oh, Darren, I had this one here. Why did Wi Fi timer got that? Experiencing your perspective over the last 10 years has been amazing. Motion and lotion, motion is lotion, create creating is empowering, and learning is ethereal. Freedom isn't free. Much love, much love to you, my brother, too. And absolutely, and thank you for sharing. Uh, you've been very generous to me in these uh super chats, so I very much appreciate that. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't. I don't ask you guys for super chats. Uh, you know, as far as how what I offer, freedomfarmers.com. And we've got that offer right now, 50% off for the first year. It's insane value. If you're if you if you want to even just watch my weekly homestead accelerator videos, they're so valuable. You're you're getting real-time consulting basically for cheap as uh, you know, cheap as chips, so to speak. Um, so you can do that there, freedomfarmers.com. I also consult. Again, too, I'm actually consulting quite often these days. It's actually really enjoyable. I really, really enjoy helping people. So if people want to do, uh, interested in that, go to the urbanfarmer.co, urbanfarmer.co, and go to the consulting page. You can just message me in there and we'll connect. Um, and uh, Clint E says, if you're famous for 15 minutes, you are one of 500 million. Exactly. And that's why that whole thing is so profound that, that, uh, Andy Warhol said is because it's basically worthless. And it's it's kind of like Michael Malice's analogy of anarchy is that if we're all experiencing anarchy in all of our voluntary relationships, you kind of devalue anarchy. And so that's what I would say to that. But yeah, I would also say to anybody in the stream, you have any connections to any of these people that I've mentioned um, that would like to have a conversation with me, I would love to do that in a totally amicable and goodwill way, not there, not here to ridicule people and talk shit just here to talk about ideas and hopefully elevate the conversation. And so 
That's what I'm going to leave you with, folks, tonight. Thank you so much for joining me on this stream. Again, head over to freedomfarmers.com for that that 50% uh, year off offer. The, the link is in the show, the show notes of this video. And uh, I really appreciate your guys' questions. And um, come over to Twitter. Come over to the space and, and talk. We'll actually riff. We'll actually talk. So come over to the Twitter space at 8. I'm going to go and reload my wood stoves. I might be starting a couple minutes early or a couple minutes late, and I'll be starting with a musical track. I'm not sure what that's going to be yet. I think it might be... It might be... Uh, I haven't decided yet. I've got a list that I that I'm pulling from, and I kind of as I listen to music, I add stuff to it. So, don't know what it is yet, but we'll see you over there, folks. Take care.